My name's Taryn Edwards, and I'm one of the eight librarians that we have on staff here at the Mechanics Institute. And one of the delights of my job is that I get to plan fun events like this. How many of you have never been here before? Fabulous. Well, I hope you're having a good time so far, right? Wonderful. Can you hear me all right? OK. Um, so where do I start? All right, let me let me thank our sponsor for tonight, the Raft Distillery. Did you all have a chance to taste something? <laughs> the rum is pretty good. I'm going to hit that after I'm done talking. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Let me tell you a little bit about Mechanics Institute since most of you have never been here before. Mechanics Institute has, uh, was founded in December of 1854. So we're 163 years old. We're the oldest library in the West designed to serve the public. We are the oldest chess club in the United States and we are a fun place with all kinds of activities and events and classes. Since we are so old, we are still a membership organization like all libraries were in California prior to 1878. I can talk to you a lot about that. If you ever want to come back here and take a tour, please come. We have a free tour every Wednesday at noon. Quarterly, we have them in the evenings at 6 o'clock, which involves wine and other goodies. The next one is April 2nd. Um, so, this is our library. There's a whole other level upstairs, so I want you, after the event tonight, to trundle upstairs and peek through uh, the glass doors and take a look at that part of it. We also have a chess room on the fourth floor. We have a lot of fun times here, as you can tell. Um, now I'm going to talk about Lee. Lee Bruno, our speaker tonight, has been a mechanics member for, I don't know, 15 years. We have uh, been friends for about eight. I, uh, he wrote his first book, Panorama, here, and also uh, worked on a lot of this book here as well, and of course, making friends with all our librarians. That's one of the hallmarks of Mechanics Institute, is we love to promote our members. We love to help our members with whatever creative project you're working on. We have a wonderful staff, a beautiful library, and lots of other services to help you get whatever it is you're working on done, be it starting a business, writing a book, or just looking for something good to read. You're all smiling at me. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Lee, I would love to have you come up and start your talk. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so like test. Yeah. <laughs> test, test, test. I guess I'm good. I'm wired. One thing I have not blown. So thank you, Taryn, and uh, thanks to Mechanics Institute. This is like an incredible place for the people that have been here for years or those who are just new to it. Um, it's pretty amazing, and the leadership of the leadership now uh, creating more salons, more uh, cross sections. Uh, between different parts of the city is really important and uh, vital, and I'm thrilled to be here. I just want to say um, thanks to Cameron Books for putting their energy and their effort behind this book. This was like, uh, this sprang out of uh, my first book, Panorama, and, um, and the members of the uh, staff at uh, Cameron are just, uh, just amazing. So you will... Uh, once you open up the book, you will see what I mean. Uh, great design and whatnot. So I'm just going to read a, a, just a little bit to start. We'll go through some slides of the, uh, of the book. And I um, want to leave like 10, 15 minutes of questions, maybe 10 minutes of questions. Because I know in the audience there's always like people that know 10 times what I know about any one character. So <laughs> I'm always humbled. When I wrote my first book, Panorama, I wanted to understand my great-grandfather, Arby Hale's role as visionary and director of the Pan Pacific Exposition of 1915. 
After several years of poking around in books and archives, I learned his story and the stories of San Franciscans who for more than a decade of twists, turns, and heartbreaks pursued a dream with remarkable drive and resilience. It opened up a world of stories and historical events that surprised me with their diverse cast of oddball characters, ranging from ingenious inventors to mischievous artists to corrupt politicians, all resolute in the shared quest to establish San Francisco as one of the great cities of the world. I was hooked. Those quirky, endearing characters set me on a quest to discover more. Many of us have met our fair share of misfits and eccentrics and know they're not an endangered species. Many enjoy the community of others in local clubs and organizations across the Bay Area, like the South End Rowing Club to which I belong. Our club plays special tribute to this coldest week of the winter, which was February 9th, um, by jumping into the bay wearing only a swimsuit, cap, and goggles, and just for the thrill to experience what we call a nutcracker swim. <laughs> Works out to two hours of swimming, some four miles, with the tide and bone-chilling temperatures around 49 degrees. So why the title, Misfits, Merchants, and Mayhem? I don't know about you, but I can't resist stories of these kinds of characters, including those that I've run into the course of my life. As more of these misfit stories arose up out of books, newspapers, and letters, they stuck in my mind and wouldn't leave. It probably has something to do with their spellbinding qualities, their irascible, unconforming, unrelenting, and having a hefty appetite for taking risks as they reinvent themselves. Yet misfits and eccentrics often get a bad rap in history, depicted as strange people with mental afflictions. But it's the very essence of their character that beckons us to root for them as they pursue their dreams unleash their powers on those people around them and transform their world. It's those qualities we admire and perhaps secretly fantasize we too could possess. The boom and the bust of the West was the perfect playground for these men and women, an unsettled landscape sharply contrasting the East and its underlying and established social mores. Neuropsychologist and author David Weeks studied a thousand eccentrics over the course of 400 years in his book, Eccentrics, The Study of Sanity and Strangeness. He pinpointed some of the shared characteristics in, in, his, in this book. He included that they were highly curious and creative, idealistic and armed with a mischievous sense of humor, and most important, they're not much interested in the opinions of others. Yes, these charming crackpots refuse to hold commonly held beliefs, nor do they want to act in accordance with the norms of society. So we're going to get to the first slide. This is a, an 1884 illustration showing Yerba Buena before the discovery of gold um, around 1846, 1847. So in 1844, for most people that know their history about this area, there were only about a dozen houses and, uh, that served commerce. The area was uh, just a point of exchange for trading goods between the Spanish and Mexican ranchers and East Coast merchant vessels. So here's another. Now, these, these, um, these illustrations that are at the Bancroft and there's also at the... Yeah, it's just pretty remarkable. Um, when I went into Ralph's office, Ralph Lewin, who's the director here, and I showed him this this uh, illustration, he immediately did what most people do, and he says, where is the Mechanics Institute? So, you know, you, you look at Montgomery Street, and you go, wait a minute, Montgomery Street is right on the waterfront. Okay, so there's a lot of Bayfield. But you, you, just, you, just, you just, this sort of transports you back into a different time, and I think that's, what I'm, that's what's so evocative about the, uh, the images and the illustrations. The year before the gold rush, only 11 ships dropped anchor in San Francisco Bay, nine whalers and two merchant ships. After gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill, some 650 American and foreign vessels arrived, carrying more than 90,000 passengers. Many abandoned their ships in the mud flats of San Francisco shores, where several remain entombed today. And I, I think you probably saw the, the Exploratorium, and, um, also the National Park Service and See, they've done this extensive sort of mapping underground, and there's going to probably be an exhibit that comes out to show some, some of the locations and history of that. So here we are, this view of San Francisco, the waterfront, 1850, just rough. And as you can see, these, again, this just detailed illustration that when it, you know, in the, in the size that it was and then it was blown up, it just continues to just marvel you in its, uh, 
in its detail. Gambling saloons, hotels, and restaurants offered a place for men in, to socialize. They passed their hours drinking, playing billiards, and gambling. Nearly all the saloons and gambling houses employed prostitutes who drank with the men and sat at card tables to attract other player, players. A woman walking along the streets of San Francisco was reportedly more of an oddity than an elephant or a giraffe. The town's wide open living conditions created a wild atmosphere that lacked the moral and social restraints men were accustomed to in their hometowns. So this is just the table of contents and just, just briefly these are 28 stories spanning 1849 to 1934 um, and I tried to pick uh, individuals and characters that had um, an impact not only on the moment that they arrive, but it's sort of lasting into, you can sort of see the ripples from these uh, unique characters. And you'll also see just with the, the, the characteristics that I kind of outlined that David Weeks has, had used and then some of the others um, are very evident in all of these characters. So, so I, of course, what book about misfits uh, wouldn't be, uh, it just wouldn't, couldn't be without Joshua Norton, the benevolent dick emperor. More than 150 years ago, we discover San Francisco's most enduring misfit. This man was well-dressed and had a serious look on his face when he walked into the office of San Francisco Bulletin newspaper editor, George Fitch. He handed Fitch an unusual letter, which had all the makings of a good story to lighten the mood because of most San Franciscans were mourning the death of the popular abolitionist Senator David Broderick, who'd been killed in a duel at Lake Merced by pro-slavery Chief Justice David Terry. The editor printed the proclamation in the paper under the heading, Have We an Emperor Among Us? And uh, John is here in the audience, and he is the resident expert on... Um, oops, sorry about this. I just... Um, he's a resident ex expert on, on Emperor Norton. Um, and it, it said, I, Joshua Norman, formerly of Agua Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the past nine years and ten months of San Francisco, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of these United States. So here's, here's, this, here's this guy that arrives. You know, he's... Sorry, I'm just trying to get my notes here. This, where's my tech guy? What's this, the slide bar? Anybody? Um, I'm just going to, all right, let's see if I can do this without cursing forward. Okay, sorry. I just had a question. So my slide bar here, just to go down through here. Oh, okay, all right. I wasn't gripping it. Okay, thank you. Small technical. So Norton goes on to urge his San Franciscans to assemble in the music hall of this city to make alterations in the existing laws of the Union to ameliorate the evils under which this country is laboring. So Norton's backstory was he was a successful businessman who tried to corner the rice market um, three years earlier, and he disappears from San Francisco and returns and enters George Fitch's office. As emperor, he became this mascot beloved by San Franciscans and written about by reporters at the papers. And he sent orders to Abraham Lincoln, Mexican President Porfirio Diaz, Tsar Alexander of Russia, and Queen Isabella of Spain. I am going to get this, uh, this control right. I'm sorry about this. Uh, the emperor made it his business to go about town inspecting San Francisco streets, monitoring the behavior of police, a natural orator, he gave speeches to bystanders about the problems of the city, and popular legend says he held at bay a vicious anti-Chinese mob by <coughs> reciting the, the Lord's Prayer. Some 21 years later, in 1880, Emperor Norton collapsed from a heart attack walking up California near Grant. His only possessions on him were a gold and silver piece and an 1828 franc. His fans gave him an elaborate funeral fitting for an emperor attended by 30,000 loyal subjects. So, okay, sure. We'll just make it bigger. This is the wonders of PowerPoint. Ooh. Oh, good, I like that. Thank you. Okay, so 1850s, and Taryn just said this is when the Mechanics Institute started. So here we have another unusual <coughs> misfit. 
Mr. Henry Meggs, who walked the same streets as the Emperor Norton. He was known as Honest Harry, a swashbuckling capitalist who built the biggest sawmills on the West Coast, and by age 26 had amassed a fortune as a Manhattan lumber dealer before the Panic of 1837 put his company out of business on the East Coast. The irrepressible Megs rebounded, then headed for San Francisco with a ship loaded with lumber to supply the Gold Rush City, much in need of the wood to rebuild from its half dozen major fires. He rolled his mighty profits, 20x, into two small sawmills and began building piers in the city, becoming the biggest landowner in the area, amassing $500,000 in gold or $15 million in today's currency. In 1854, real estate prices plunged from rampant speculation, forcing him into bankruptcy, which he managed to keep secret through a Ponzi scheme. As a city councilman, he embezzled a million dollars from the city, $29 million in today's currency, which wiped out hundreds of unwitting investors, most of the city's bank reserves. He finally realized the gig was up. So fearing for his life, he left, he left town in the middle of the night, sailed for Peru, but the story goes is that as his ship was sailing out of the bay, uh, word got around and some of the investors who were armed with guns and uh, definitely wanted to hang him, pursued him in a, a sideboat st steamer and one of their paddles was broken. They were just about to get to him at the Farallons Islands when the wind came up and all of a sudden Megs is off to Peru. So with this pot of muddy and a mob of investors chasing his ship, he arrives in South America, where he begins building railroads in Chile and Peru, made millions and eventually paid back every cent he owed to investors and the city of San Francisco. He died in 1877 in Lima, Peru, while constructing a railroad in Costa Rica. So William Shorey, some people know Shorey. I think he may even have a, a plaque on the, on the waterfront. Um, the Pacific's Whaling Prince is the way I capture him in the book. And this is a picture where he's posed in Oakland with, in the late um, 1880s with, as a family portrait with his wife and children who often were on him on his whaling voyage. And at the time, I mean, just whaling voyages were super dangerous. So um, this says something about the caliber of the man and also um, his, his fortitude. Uh, so William Shorey, who was called Black Ahab, established himself as the only African-American ship captain and large ship owner on the Pacific coast a few years after the Civil War had ended. Born in 1859 to a Scottish father and a Creole mother, he grew up on the West Indian island of Barbados. He became a cabin boy on a ship bound for Boston, where he had learned uh, navigational skills and uh, was sort of tutored in this. But he was, a, he was a very serious student and continued to pry his skill, and several years later he ends up in San Francisco in 1878, where he captained successful whaling voyage to the Arctic and Pacific for more than 30 years. Despite mishaps and a near mutiny when his white crewmen set fire to his ship, he retired in uh, 1908 and uh, worked as a security officer in the uh, port, uh, on the, in, the, in, port in, in Oakland. Um, and here is a picture of a slain, slain whale. This is not from that period, I think it's a little bit later at Point San Pedro. So Julia Morgan, um, everybody knows Julia Morgan, I think, in the Bay Area. It's like she's quite a, a remarkable. And, I, and she put her, I put her in my category of misfits because she really was um, unrelenting in her drive and, um, and a person that uh, had been told that, uh, you know, really you, you probably shouldn't pursue uh, architecture. But this is a picture where she's visiting Notre Dame in Paris in 1901. And she became the first woman admitted to the architecture program at L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts. Uh, women like the great architect Julie Morgan was undeterred by the fact that women didn't have a path to become architects. Yet she went on to become California's first woman licensed architect and designed more than 700 buildings over the span of her prodigious career. She was born in San Francisco in 1872. She took a class at UC Berkeley with architect Bernard Maybeck, whose design philosophy emphasized materials should fit their environment, ideas that profoundly influenced her efforts to introduce environmentally sensitive architecture to the West Coast. Maybeck encouraged her to study architecture in Paris at the Le Col des Beaux-Arts. After, uh, after pressure from a union of French female artists and three exams, which 
she had, she had, she had not made the pro proper marks to pass. She became the first woman admitted to that school. In 1902, she became the first credentialed female architect in California and opened San Francisco office on Montgomery Street. She, after the uh, 1906 quake, she was one of the architects and also this a massive rebuilding that went on in the city and worked on the Fairmont Hotel. And there's a picture in the, in the, in the book of, of that as well. Um, this is, uh, this, 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 um, this view uh, is of James Lombard's Piedmont home in 1915. Um, so after, so her office is, is destroyed in the 1906 uh, fire, earthquake and fire, and she does these amazing projects. She in included her, her probably most famous uh, are the ones that she did for William Randolph Hearst, uh, the, uh, Los and the, uh, which was the Los Angeles Examiner Building and the Hearst Castle. Her residential architecture work is embedded in the arts and craft movement and won her international acclaim. And there were merchants with a penchant for eccentric tendencies like the Crowley brothers, shown here. Tim and Dave Crowley converse at the Howard Street Wharf in San Francisco around 1905. As a child, Thomas Crowley fell in love with Whitehall boats, known as the Bicycles of the Sea, used to ferry services and sailors to and, to and from boats coming into New York Harbor, and these boats were named after Whitehall Street. In 1892, at the age of 17, Crowley purchased an 18-foot Whitehall boat for $80 in San Francisco and began a water taxi service, delivering supplies, passengers, and crew members to and from ships anchored in San Francisco Bay. Armed with an unrelenting drive and mischievous sense of humor, the Crowley brothers realized in 1897 they needed to upgrade their rowboats to gasoline-powered boats to reach vessels faster. By the early 1900s, the Crowley brothers had established a strong taxi service to ship, uh, for ship owners and merchants. Six million tons of goods from around the world passed through San Francisco at the time, making San Francisco port the international trading center of the we uh, America's West Coast. The brothers continued to grow and expand over the next several decades to keep pace with the boom in the global shipping and the outbreak of World War I. Both the Red and White Fleet Ferry Service and Crowley Maritime that both sprang from these two men's dream and vision, and they survive today. Uh, Crowley Maritime is like a multi-billion dollar uh, company, um, and it's pretty impressive. I'm going to read just a little excerpt from the, from the book uh, about the Crowley brothers who definitely had the mischievous sense of humor and uh, a, a, an unrelenting drive. Crowley's ambition kept him drawing a fine line between playing fair and breaking the rules in being the first launch to arrive at a ship and, and other taxi service. His eagerness got him in hot water with the Federal Quarantine Service yet again when he and his men approached an oncoming ship, incoming ship as reported in the June 27, 1905 San Francisco call. The six men, quote, the six men had gone alongside the ship Aaron before it had been released from quarantine. They claimed to have waited until the yellow flag was hauled down before making those close connections with Aaron's steep sides. The problem was the flag had been prematurely lowered without official clearance of the medical officer on duty. The officer demanded the flag be raised again, and the six men were intercepted and towed to Angel Island's quarantine station, where Surgeon Cumming, quote, Surgeon Cumming, sentenced the offenders to be vaccinated against plague, according to the San Francisco call. Dr. Drew had six men aboard their taxi service arrested, which included Thomas Crowley, David Crowley, senior Michael Coleman for the sailor's home, Steve Cassidy, a runner for a produce room, and Captain Kitgard and, Stuart <coughs> and James Sennett, gas, uh, the gasoline pilot, uh, launch pilot. As the men left the operating room, one of the doctors referred to the after effects of the vaccinations, which would surely cause physical discomfort and nausea. And when the vaccination takes, just let your thoughts dwell on that section of the law forbidding communication with quarantine vessels. We have other tortures here, but if that vaccine acts as I hope, it will hold you all for a while. Um, this was a, this, uh, it, in, in um, Crowley did this wonderful or oral history with the, uh, San, uh, with the uh, Berkeley uh, Bancroft Library in the 60s, and he talks about how he thought this was just a complete joke, that uh, it was just um, ways to, to make money uh, for the city. So anyway, <clears throat> onward to Lou Hing. Um, 
Liu Hing, uh, here he's sitting in a portrait taken in the 18, late 1890s with one of his daughters on his knee and one of his sons standing on his side. Other merchants like Liu Hing faced challenging obstacles in the business career that began in 1871 when he sailed from China to San Francisco. And within six years, he pioneered commercial scale food canning and established the Pacific Coast Canning Company. He'd use his creative ingenuity to drive his experiments in canning to figure out how to safely can foods on a large scale. Chinese faced discrimination at the time, especially after an economic downturn during the 1870s. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act stopped Chinese immigration and prevented Chinese already in the country from owning real estate. Hing's unrelenting drive and shrewd business instincts helped him weather not just discrimination, but legal run-ins like the authorities when they seized 516 cans of illicit opium that bore the label of his company. He was eventually cleared of the charge. In 1906, after the great earthquake and fire destroyed his home, Hing helped victims, opening his cannery to the homeless and feeding them. He expanded his business to include fruit orchards, a hotel, import and export companies, and became president of the Canton Bank of San Francisco. Despite discrimination, Hing's reputation as a respected businessman and community leader increased. He died in 1934 with scarcely a mention of his passing in the local newspapers. So Irving Scott, um, this is uh, another wonderful Mechanic Institute. Uh, uh, well, I don't know if he's a, Taryn, is he a founder or is he, no, he was just, he was an early, he, he was one of the early crowd. So Irving Scott, um, the man who made iron ships. In 1865, Peter Donahue, a failed gold prospector and iron foundry pioneer, sold his iron works, Union Iron Works, to his apprentice, Irving Murray Scott, a 28-year-old with a sharp mind and an aptitude for all things mechanical. After he bought the iron works, Scott designed and built most of the machinery used to mine the silver of the Comstock load in, in Nevada. He went on to make a fortune by manufacturing and selling equipment to mine owners and railroad companies. Scott recognized that mining boom, the mining booms wouldn't last forever and shifted to building locomotives and ships. He spent three nights a week at the Mechanics Institute, the fourth night in the study of German, and the fifth at a lecture of one kind or another. In 1880, Scott went on a trip around the world with San Francisco businessman James Fair. And while in Europe, he made a close study of the industries and industrial establishments of several countries, paying special attention to the shipbuilding of France and England. When he returned home, Scott expanded the Union Iron Works and relocated it to Portrero Point. It now covered more than 25 acres of San Francisco waterfront at Pier 70 and was the largest and most versatile iron works in the United States. In fact, the Union Iron Works rivaled the East Coast shipyards, and that was quite a coup because we, uh, you know, we were just the West Coast. And we were, you know, a lot of the East Coast establishment just kind of looked down on us and didn't think we were much of, much of anything. In 1885, the plant built the first steel hulled ship in the Pacific Rim in the 1890s, the USS San Francisco, a steel protected naval cruiser that defended the American coast from German submarines in World War I. Union, Union Iron Works built the US battleship Oregon. And if you read about uh, any of the times when the USS Oregon was in uh, port, it was like this massive celebration. It was, uh, San Franciscans were just absolutely gaga over this ship. Um, he died in 1903, and today the shipbuilding site is owned by the city of San Francisco, which is planning to develop the area and restore some of its huge industrial buildings. It's quite an interesting project. Um, so we, so in this, uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the book, I hit this era of the 1906 quake, and this is a famous photograph. Anybody know what the, whose photograph this is? Genthy, good. So it's Arnold Genthy, um, and he's also uh, featured in the book. But this is uh, looking down Sacramento Street after this, uh, on the morning of uh, April 18th, 1906. Genthy basically toured the city after his apartment had been destroyed he went down to a camera shop on Montgomery Street and went in and asked, you know, can I buy a camera? The camera owner said, uh, my shop's going to go up in flames. Take what you want. He took a camera, uh, a small new Kodak, and stuffed his pockets with uh, film and circled around the city, um, pretty much exhausting himself over those days. And um, it's a pretty, uh, if you've seen any of the celebration of the 1906 quake, the images are just absolutely uh, stunning. And so some of the images of his are in this book, and I urge you to look at for others. The earthquake left more than 3,000 people dead and destroyed more than 28,000 buildings. 
Expert, experts estimate that 300,000 out of the 410,000 residents were left homeless, half of whom fled to other cities and countries. Damages were estimated at around 500 million, uh, which is nearly 13 billion today. This is this, uh, the burn area, this William Lee's uh, map, which is just absolutely uh, quite stunning. And again, on, a f on the full layout of the book, it, it really, uh, these images uh, sing. Uh, and the city rising from ashes, this was, this is only two years after. And if you see this, uh, these, this is the Great White Fleet, Teddy Roosevelt. So it's, it's like these. It's like my lights. Not, oh, there it is. Yeah. So you can see these. This is done. Um, and my first book, which is about the Pan Pacific Exposition, really starts in 1904 and goes to 1915. But the rebuilding, the rampant rebuilding of the city of San Francisco was quite amazing. And by, um, by 1909, uh, three years later, uh, they're doing kind of their first Portola Festival, which is kind of like um, this mini, it was a small scale fair but it was a test run for the first World's Fair, which was the Pan Pacific Exposition. So, getting to the waterfront and the great uh, Italian fishing community. Achille Palladini. Italians like Italian, Ach Achille Palladini pioneered the fishing industry in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century. The Italians had dominated the West Coast fishing industry due to their skill and technology. On Saturdays, fishermen would mend their nets while in port, as shown here in 1905. Palladini arrived in San Francisco from Italy in 1865 on a merchant ship and encountered a picturesque city and a thriving Italian community. He learned there was money to be made as a fisherman. Italians dominated the industry with a bay abundant with Dungeness crab, oysters, salmon, and striped bass. He worked hard and applied his creative and cunning skills to the business, inventing in his own boats and uh, investing in his own boats and real estate. He loved opera and was living the high life until 1906 when the earthquake destroyed all of his uninsured properties and left him broke. Palladini went back to fishing with a small boat, a hand cart for peddling his fish, then acquired a horse and a wagon, and then a small fish stand. He was, a, he was an aggressive businessman and widely known for being the first to can tuna on the Pacific coast. Fishermen would typically leave um, on these, um, these uh, let me just see if I can highlight this with again. with the, These are felucas. Uh, let me see if my light works. Anyway, you can see the spars from the felucas. These are latine rigged. Um, very versatile boats that could be rowed with the tide and, um, you know, with the ingenuity of these fishermen. They would, it's very small. These are uh, relatively short and really not much of a, of, of a place to stay out of the weather. Um, and very dangerous conditions, but these were, these fishermen were quite in a class of their own and they worked uh, extremely hard to, to, to grab the, the wonderful fish that we had in abundance at the time. Um, this picture is of the 1920s Fisherman's Wharf. By 1910, A. Palladini Company had grown into an formidable uh, powerhouse and came under the scrutiny of the California antitrust regulators for its monopolistic market practices. Despite the challenging setback, Palladini grew his operation over the next decade into the West Coast's largest wholesale seafood distributor. He died in 1921 at the age of 78. And of course, there are stories of mayhem. So as, as, as we know, this, uh, the, you know, the early 18, the 1850s, there's hardly any of, uh, they're a non-existent police force. And um, we have this wonderful story about Isaiah Lees, who some people probably already know. But this, he was, the way I pegged him in the book is he he's the bunk, mugshot detective. He was born in Scotland and came to San Francisco's shore as an iron worker. After witnessing a murder, he brought the perpetrator to justice and, and decided to become a patrol officer in 1853 when lawless was, was a part of everyday life and the police force was nearly non-existent. The sudden rise in population from the gold rush had brought many desperate cri criminals to our shores and Lee's solved many famous ca criminal cases during the course of his career as he moved up to detective, including a double murder with dogged investigation skills. The curious Lee studied the autobiography of Francois Vidoc, the world's first private detective from Fer Paris who pioneered the use of disguises, informants, detailed criminal records, and meticulous record keeping. But Lee's applied his methods and then also realized that criminal, that with the rise of photography at the time, 
that he could take photographs of criminals and as a, as a result, he, over the course of his career, um, by the time he retired, he had 15,000 photographs of, uh, of criminals. And he had made these trips back and forth to Scotland, and Scotland Yard still has a picture of him hanging uh, in, in their... Um, location. Uh, th so this is just, again, he, re he retired in 1900 um, and was quite a remarkable character. Um, so the Barbary Coast, which was known for its many vices, and Lee's, uh, Isaiah Lee's news all, all too well, uh, its, its worldwide reputation for brothels and whatnot. Um, but the world of brothels and uh, vice was sort of c being kind of closed off um, from progressive movements. So on January 25th, 1917, some 300 female prostitutes organized by two madams, Reggie Gamble and Maud Spencer, marched in protest, an anti-prostitution -pro crusade by Reverend Paul Smith. A nationwide anti-prostitution -pro reform movement had finally reached San Francisco's shores. Our city had a long tradition of prostitution on the Barbary Coast, the area between North Beach and the financial district came under attack. In 1917, the Red, Ab Red Light Abatement Act gave city authorities the right to impose civil court actions against any property used for purposes of prostitution, and 1,400 sex workers were evicted, marking the end of the sanctioned brothels. Reggie Gamble asked Reverend Smith a question that would haunt him. Are you trying to reform us, or are you trying to reform social conditions? You leave us alone. It is too late to do anything with us. Give your attention to the boys and girls in the schools and to the social conditions responsible for the spread of prostitution. Well, that's good. And of course, um, coming towards the, the bookend of the other side of it is the, 19, the Great Strike of 1934, which there's still a lot of living oral history. Um, people that, you know, even, the, even those few talks I've already given, that's like, Amazing the stories that start popping up. But anyway, San Francisco's port was booming with work and maritime commerce in the 1930s during the Great Depression, but was marked by the violent conflict between longshoremen and shipping owners. On July 3rd, 1934, those tensions led to a strike that paralyzed our port and led to utter mayhem. Longshoremen had walked out of their jobs demanding reforms and hiring practices and pay. Owners, desperate as their losses mounted, recruited and provided police protection for strike breakers in the ports, determined to crush the strike. The, the longshoremen stood their ground. Alfred Bridges, better known as Harry Bridges, was the chief spokesman for the union in the negotiations. Like other longshoremen, he was forced to work grueling shifts at an unrelenting pace that was unsafe and led to two injuries. Bridges was a consummate and unrelenting organizer. He visited black churches and asked congregations to join the strikers, promising that blacks would be able to work on West Coast docks when the strike was over. Eventually, the thousands of striker, striking longshoremen prevailed after four weeks of strikes, our city barely surviving the killing of two strikers, hundreds of bloody skirmishes, citywide labor walkouts, and owners suffering big losses from undelivered, spoiled goods stranded on the dock. In the aftermath, Bridges kept his promise to blacks that all peers were open to them. Harry Bridges served as the president of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union for 40 years and died in 1990 at the age of 88. And that is, that is the conclusion of my...